Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, lovely to see a lot of people that I know in the audience. And those of you who do know me will know that I have only been doing this job for six months. So I'm going to take the opportunity of sharing with you a lot of the things I've learned about the ambulance service in the last six months, which I hope will help you think about its role in urgent and emergency care in London um, and the challenges that we are facing. So what I've been asked to talk to you about this afternoon is, so what does the London Ambulance Service do? What's the range of what it does? We all think we know that. Um, I've learned it's a lot more complicated, perhaps, than we might initially think. Um, what do the facts and figures tell us about what's happening in London? Um, and then look at the picture from a London wine perspective, which of course is what the board and my organisation does, and then try and look at it a little bit from your perspective, be it a provider or a, a CCG perspective, and then think about the steps to improve and leave you with some thoughts and ideas to take into that work that Joe's described uh, you're going to do this afternoon. Uh, so the place to start is what is the range of things we do. Um, and at one end, we absolutely deal with public disorder. We have specialist teams who are ready to respond in things like the Notting Hill Carnival, where they have all their equipment in rucksacks on their back and they run after the police to the place where the um, incidents are happening. We, particularly in London, have focused on a response to marauding terrorism, as like the Mumbai incident. So the most extreme end. Um, so think Holby City, think casualty and go a bit further. Yes, we do do some of that stuff and we train hard and we work with the police and the fire to do that. Um, and we also do uh, 30 to 40 cardiac arrests uh, a day in London. Uh, we do stabbings, we do road traffic accidents um, and those who are involved with the trauma network implementation will know that we have more penetrating trauma than anywhere else in the country and you can all draw your own conclusions as to why that might be. And we do a whole range of activities where we are supporting the population of London, whether it's uh, maternity, including a number of births that happen in ambulances or at the edge of the street. That's not an ideal location for them, of course, but we do do that. A significant amount of mental health work, uh, the old people that fall over and urinary tract infections, which uh, we see very frequently. So we do the full range. Um, and when thinking about the ambulance service, you need to hold all those in your mind. Um, the ambulance service is awash with numbers and I am going to give you a few, uh, but for me I find it more helpful to think about the weekly numbers than the annual numbers. I can't process the annual numbers, they're too big. Um, but if you think of the sheer number of times that somebody in London's picking up a phone and dialing 999 every week, it's in excess of 32,000 times. Um, and Cat A are the life-threatening calls, you'll hear them call Cat A, you'll hear them call the red calls. Um, that's where that top end stuff appears, but Cat C, as you can see, which are all the other ones, that's where the bulk of our business is done. And again, I think the weekly numbers help us understand that. I've then broken down for you some of the major causes of uh, our attendances, and you will see the mental health services as is, is as high as the calls to pregnancy and miscarriage and childbirth related ones. Um, and the traffic and transportation accidents are still quite high when you think of the number of those happening across the week across London. What we've been working on increasingly over the last few years with PCTs and now increasingly with CCG colleagues is so what do we do when that phone call arrives? And one of the starting principles for us and other ambulance services is we need to categorise it, so we triage it and then we categorise it. And then are there a range of, of calls that we then don't send anything to? So here and treat is that category. Um, and in order to do that, do we either divert it to somebody else or do we have a clinical person based in one of our control rooms who talks to that patient and makes a judgment? That is undoubtedly an area that we can grow and I'll talk at the end about what we're doing with the investment that CCG colleagues have made this year and next year to grow that capacity. But the judgment of course is it is much more difficult to triage and make a clinical decision when all you're doing is talking to somebody down the phone. And GP colleagues in the room who do that day in, day out will know how difficult that is with patients that you know and you've got information about them on the front of you on the screen. For my colleagues, they're doing it on the basis of one phone call with probably no further information. There's then a further category where we are again, and CCGs are encouraging us to increase, which is where we attend and we don't convey the patient. And this is where we get into the area of public expectation. 
The public expectation where it dials 999 is it believes we're going to arrive with a large ambulance that has four wheels, two paramedics, and we're going to take it to the very nearest hospital. Now, we know in London that we've changed some of that expectation if you think about trauma and stroke and heart attack centres. Um, and increasingly in central London, we don't send an ambulance. We send a car, we send a bike, we send a push bike. Um, and the public is interesting in how it processes when somebody arrives on a push bike that they're clearly not going to be taken straight to hospital. <laughs> um, we haven't experimented with transporting on a push bike before anybody thinks of it. So see and treat is an area that we need to grow and we want to grow, but part of it is linked to how quickly we have to respond. And the category A where we have to respond in eight minutes if we possibly can, what kind of service do we send to that versus what might be a slightly slower service for see and treat. And again, I've given you the weekly figures because I think it makes it more digestible to understand what we're doing. So this is where we move into reality. Um, and I've given you a 10-year growth there. So that's the number of incidents year on year. In it's in inextricable, and it's only going one way. Um, and this is the life-threatening, the Cat A incidents. The event that happened in 2004, 5 to 5, 6 is the definition of Cat A changed. So that is what happened. It's not an enormous bulge in something in population in London. But it's only going one way. Um, so what that tells us is... Uh, that the calls are increasing and the incidents are increasing and the amount of those that are categorised as Cat A are increasing. And that's a challenge for every one of us. It's a challenge for my service today, yesterday and tomorrow, but actually it's a challenge for all of us. And of course all those patients that we convey turn up at the front door of colleagues here who run acute hospitals. So more people calling 999, more people who call 999 are presenting with a serious illness. Um, and we still convey about 70% of the patients that we attend. Um, the numbers th that can be resolved on the telephone at the moment have stayed static, and partly we believe that's a function of the amount of clinical advice we have available at the end of the phone, which is why CCGs have invested in increasing that. Um, the numbers that have conveyed have stayed static, and demand is rising across London. And that is something that I'm sure every CCG colleague and provider colleague um, in, the, in the room would agree with. That's, that's what it feels like. Uh, so for me, as we amend a, develop a new way of dealing with that problem, what's the London-wide picture? I think part of my responsibility with whatever changes we make is to ensure that for London, I can provide a robust and flexible CAT A response for those life-threatening conditions 24-7, and that I can support the London Marathon and uh, whatever events happen, however many bike races Boris decides to have, whatever the activities are in London, that I can support that, and we have the capability to deal with marauding terrorism and public disorder. I think that's what you, as the NHS system, require of me as the ambulance service in London. However, uh, there are only a limited number of calls where those minutes and seconds are absolutely key. Um, and we have increasingly, as you may know, been working with the public about outputting uh, defibrillators in all public places, training the public increasingly to use them so that they're part of the solution to dealing with those 30 to 40 uh, life-threatening cases where it's a cardiac arrest. And I think for the London-wide picture, the other thing to hold on to is we've proved that together the entirety of us together, we can implement some quite complicated changes in the system. Um, and whether that's stroke or trauma or the heart attack service, um, we have now got to a place where most of the time, when one of my paramedics says, Mrs. Bloggs, I'm going to take you to St. George's because that's the local trauma centre, this is how it works, they don't have a debate. They understand why they're flying past a number of a couple of other hospitals to get to that place that's going to offer them the best specialist service. Um, in terms of the local picture, however, I think we have some real questions that certainly we in the ambulance service don't know the answer to. So why are more people picking up the phone and dialing 999? It's definitely true. It's clear. It's a real experience. Is it about what we're doing in health? Or is it, as I think I'm starting to think, it might be more to do with a sociological shift in people's expectation of response, access to technology, etc.? So do we understand it? And do we understand why, of those people who dial 999, more of them are sick than were a few years ago? Is it just the frail elderly? 
Is it just the amount of isolated elderly? We certainly think alcohol is part of it as well. And if you look at the age profile, it's partly that young age group as well. And so part of the challenge, and I think we need to work with all of you, is about how we explore local solutions and keep capital-wide resilience. And I know that my service in the past has tended to say one size fits all for London. I think there is an and. I think there is a London-wide responsibility and we have to make sure that works. And there may need to be differing local solutions for CCGs. In practical terms, it needs to be manageable. I need to be able to translate it into a set of instructions for a group of paramedics or my control room. But I don't think that precludes local solutions. And we're seeing quite a variation in growth across London. Um, and this is not intended to be a name and shame slide, but it does show you the scale of growth. So uh, Redbridge, Hillingdon, uh, Croydon, we are seeing very significant growth in numbers, and uh, our colleagues in CCGs undoubtedly know that. Do we understand why that is so different to some others? I don't believe we do, and it's a conversation we need to have. I've just written out to every um, CCG uh, chief officer, identifying for you who I believe from my service could work with you um, at an assistant operation manager level and then a executive level uh, in either your groups of CCGs where you're working together and in your urgent care boards because I think you need us to be working with you operationally at that level and finding solutions. So I do hope you'll take up that offer. Um, so the increasing demand, the cause to us is not clear. Uh, we believe it's multifactorial, and some of the conversations we've had with you locally have suggested a number of hypotheses. So in some places, people think it's straight demographics, the population's growing faster, um, the nature of the population, the age, the mix, etc. In some places, people believe it's reconfiguration, but if I'm really honest, we haven't seen some real big movements of reconfiguration for a little while, so I'm not sure I honestly think that's the answer, but it might be. Um, some people think it's 111, and I'll, I'll say something in a, in a moment about 111. Elsewhere in the country, equivalents of me have been very, very public about saying the issues about 111. I really don't think we've seen that issue in London. I'll show you the spike we've seen, but it's not the same as outside London. And I'm not sure it explains either more 999 calls or why they are sicker, which are the two questions I think we need to answer. So we are trying to understand why internally, and we're doing some work with colleagues in Croydon in the Romford area to try and understand why. Why did I choose those two? Because Croydon University Hospital and Queen's Romford have had real operational problems in their A&E departments. Um, and because as you'll see from the growth that I've shown you on the CCG slides, there's a big growth. So that's why I've chosen those two. But my aspiration for that work is we find some tools and some ways of analysing in those two areas that we could use across all 32, because the question is the same. Level of 111 calls, I believe, has stabilised in the last couple of months. We did see a surge at the beginning, um, and we are seeing a spike over the weekend, a higher level over the weekend. Uh, the conversion rate is different across London into 999 calls, and that's one thing we don't understand, but it seems to differ by 111 provider. So that is something that we do need to understand. Um, and the CCGs put into the contract this year a 6% of total activity around 11. We're currently running at about 8%. Will we see that drop down? We don't know, because that might be part of the spike at the beginning. Uh, the demand management project that we're running internally, therefore, is trying to help us answer that question. I want a toolkit I can use with each one of you on, in the 32 CCGs to understand it. We need to understand the consistent rise in demand. And then I want to find some solutions and some options that the CCGs want to implement where the LAS can be part of the solution. Um, and if it raises questions around the rest of the system, outside health, into social care or wider, then I think that's the right uh, place to be raising them. As I've said, cro focus on Croydon and BHR, and, and those are the reasons that we've chosen those areas. Those are the two key questions. Um, so moving to our response to demand, and that can only be part of the solution. 
our response is to try and increase here and treat. So once that phone call's been made, how do we respond to it? So we're increasing capacity in both the Bow and the Waterloo control centres, people sitting at the end of those telephones 24-7, and we are moving to an all-paramedic workforce, so in other words, a healthcare registered professional sitting at the end of that phone able to take that. Now, we won't be at that place probably until the end of 2014 because there's quite a significant recruitment activity to get a full paramedic workforce in and we've got to deal with the HR issues that come with our current workforce. But that is the aspiration and we recognise the importance. Um, aiming to reduce conveyance. So understanding why we convey at the moment, how we compare across the whole of London and compare with those outside. And then trying to work out how we use the alternatives better whilst managing patient expectation. And I do think there is a piece for all of us in the room about what is the patient expectation. And I would add to that actually what an urgent care centre does. So one of the issues we find when we transfer patients to an urgent care centre, they're deeply disappointed it's not what they want. At the other end, we found quite a few times we've turned up in response to 111 calls and they've said it's very nice to see you but what we really wanted was a doctor. So there is something about matching expectations with the response we give and you know, getting it right more of the time. Um, increasing use of alternative care pathways. My message to you today is that it has to test to pass the three o'clock on a Sunday morning test for me. So if it's going to be real, my paramedic needs to know at three o'clock on a Sunday morning, if they decide to drive right to go and use an alternative care pathway, it's going to be there, it's going to be open, and whoever the clinician is that we need to be there will be there. Because if they get there and it's closed and it's not, they've then got to drive somewhere else to an A&E department. Um, and in a time of heightened regulation and increased personal responsibility, the likely response from the paramedic, if they're not confident, or the last time they went there, they were told, oh, we can't do it because Dr. Bloggs isn't in today, is they will go to an A&E department. So between us, we've got to reduce the variability. We've got to ensure the provision is consistent. We've got to make it available across the 24-7. And then we have to add to it accessibility to GPs. A little story, if I may. Um, I do a lot of ride-outs with my staff, and we went and did a, ten, uh, a five to nine visit on a Monday morning. Paramedic took 10 minutes to decide this lady needed to see a GP. It took another five minutes to convince her she needed to see a GP. We took 20 minutes hanging on the phone to not get an answer from the GP surgery. And one of the light bulb moments for me, actually, was we give all healthcare professionals privileged access to our control centre. Every one of you has a number and you bypass. We don't have that to any of the GP surgeries, folks. We sit in the line between Mrs. Blokes and Mr. Jones waiting to get through. Now, what my paramedic did on that story is he got the lady dressed, he got her shoes on, and he half, half walked her down the road towards the GP practice because he wanted confidence she was going to go. But actually, he took a risk because he hadn't passed the health care really successfully back to her and he hadn't passed it to a GP. So it seems to me there are some practical things we can do to make real change in how the system works together in a way it wants to work. I, I know this is controversial what I've put up here, but I do think we need to think about whether diverts really work. I have been stunned by the amount of time and effort that staff in my organisation and in a whole range of your organisations sweat on agreeing a divert for two or three hours. And then I say, so how many blue lights or how many ambulances did we not take? And the numbers are less than 10. And I know if you're running an A&E department, one less ambulance would be really nice. But I'm not sure it has the impact that we want it to have. And there are other parts of the country that have stopped running divert systems, except, of course, for major incidents or, you know, loss of power to a site or whatever. So I really think it's worth thinking about as we move into the winter. Two words on the future of the London Ambulance Service, partly because I have just kicked off a piece of strategy work um, and I want by the end of year to have a strategy for the London Ambulance Service which reflects our pl place in the bigger jigsaw. For me, it's about doing health assessment, treatment and transport wherever and whenever needed. And it's about being a full partner in the emergency response with police and fire. 
and I think it's that first piece, so health assessment, treatment and transport wherever and whenever needed, that we need to work on in partnership so it reflects what you truly want in the system. So, in conclusion, and that, that was fast, but to allow some time for questions, I hope, um, I think it's our job to balance the local and the city-wide. It's our job to tell you when we might be putting that at risk because we have to have that city-wide response. And we need to make sure the whole system understands how the impact locally and city-wide is working. My view is we need to accept that more people are going to phone 999. I think we've got to go with the groove that the actual people picking up the phone and dialing will go on increasing. The question is what we do with it. I think, personally, we've got to stop telling the public they don't understand the system, they're inappropriately using it. We've just got to say, fine, you phoned the NHS and you want help. Let's now advise you on how to use it. And I would really make a plea that you have real conversations with us at your local urgent care boards. We can't do 32 CCG-specific conversations. I'd love personally to come and have a conversation with each one of you. It's just not going to happen. But I do think the construct of urgent care boards and those groupings that a number of you have got together uh, for CCGs gives us two mechanisms to have real conversations. Thank you.